What is a Magnificent Bastard? Uh, simply put, they're a villain, or antagonist, the worse the better, but delightful to watch. Someone you kind of get in the side of, even though you really shouldn't. <laughs> I think I've identified the most magnificent bastard in all of film and TV history, with emphasis on the bastard. Ptolemy VIII, aka Ptolemy Fiscon, aka Ptolemy the Fat, in the Cleopatras. He was a real guy, but I'm going from the TV version. But before I go into that, here's some necessary history. The Cleopatras was the early 80s BBC's attempt to recreate the stagey theatrical magic by Claudius. Unfortunately, it all went a bit wrong. They weren't able to get the same level of talent. The biggest names involved were Uncle Vernon from Harry Potter, the best Doctor Who, this guy from Ace Ventura 2, and Saldeed. My dreams of conquest! The budget didn't stretch to even attempting to recreate many of the locations depicted, so as a result, there's a lot of black voids in ancient Egypt. They couldn't afford battle scenes, so a lot happens in dialogue and narration. It was the early 80s, so hilarious video effects were everywhere. And the theme music is just... jaunty. It gets even better when you reach the end of episode 1, and it plays over the severed head of a small child, which was just delivered to his mother. <laughs> To a great start. Uh -oh. There's so much incest, murder, rape, and abuse that it's essentially the BBC's answer to Caligula. It has more bare tits in it than the BBC managed in the entire rest of the decade. It's like early Game of Thrones, the community theatre show. It's based around the tail end of the Ptolemaic dynasty, the last dynasty of pharaohs. They were founded by Ptolemy, one of Alexander the Great's generals, and his descendants decided to copy the old pharaoh tradition of brother and sister incest. Now, there's one element that you might think was hilariously inaccurate, but isn't, and that's the whiteness much of the cast. The Ptolemies were Greek, and what with all the incest, they remained white. Most of the top level of Ptolemaic Egypt was also Greek or Greek descent, and the native Egyptians were mostly the lower classes. One thing that is inaccurate, though, is the costuming. The Ptolemaic ruling classes only wore Egyptian outfits for ceremonial purposes, and most of the time dressed like Greeks. Now, compared to some eras of Egyptology, the Ptolemaic era is a little bit fragmented. You see, all the kings were called Ptolemy and all the queens were called Cleopatra or Berenike. That would be confusing enough, but with all the incest, the family tree looks like it was designed by a conspiracy theorist. Brothers married sisters, uncles married nieces, mothers married sons. It's so confusing that historians aren't actually sure if Ptolemy VII reigned at all, or if he was the son of Ptolemy VI or Ptolemy VIII. We start about 150 years after Ptolemy I, with Ptolemy VI death in battle, and over eight hour long episodes we skip forward the better part of a century and end with Cleopatra VII, the famous one's death, as Rome conquers Egypt. Now before I begin with this, all the Ptolemies have nicknames. These have lasted since antiquity, they're still used today, it's... it makes it easier working out who's who. So why is Ptolemy VIII, known as Potbelly in the show, such a magnificent bastard? Well, let me list all the shit he does in just over two and a bit episodes. He manages to marry his dead brother's widow, his own sister, Cleopatra II. He then has his brother's heir, Ptolemy VII, murdered, blames it on the Jews, and orders the highest ranking Jewish members of his army to execute the rest of the Jewish population of Alexandria. When they refuse, they get executed first. He then has his own heir with Cleopatra II, Ptolemy Memphites, and rapes Cleopatra II's daughter, his own niece, Cleopatra III, and somehow makes her fall in love with them. So he marries Cleopatra III and has a civil war with Cleopatra II and loses, escaping Alexandria with Cleopatra III and Memphites in tow. Then he kills Memphites and sends the piece of his body back to Cleopatra II on her birthday. <laughs> that was episode one. He then raises an army, reinvades Egypt, and drives Cleopatra II out to Seleucia, where Cleopatra Thea, one of her daughters from her first marriage, is queen. He then finds a slave who looks like a pretender to the Seleucid throne and claims he's the legitimate king of Seleucia, gives him an army and sends him off to invade. This, of course, leads to yet more destabilizing conflicts, this time in Seleucia, as the king loses in battle to the pretender, gets locked out of his own capital, and is then murdered on the orders of his wife, who then murders her firstborn son, the new king, for having his own ideas. 
Eventually, Cleopatra II and Pop Billy grow weary of their little war, and she returns to Egypt as co-queen. Though this is partially because it really annoys Cleopatra III, who really, really, really hates her mother. Pop Billy then decides it would be terribly nice to be remembered well, so he starts writing his own history and public works. Forgiveness for Cleopatra II's supporters and building great monuments to the gods. Why? Because I'm a changed character. Are you? No, but there are two ways of being king. I've decided to try the other one. On his deathbed, Pop Billy does what he considers the greatest practical joke in history, as he writes a will that allows Cleopatra III to decide which of her children she will marry and rule with. He knows she'll choose her beloved second son, Ptolemy Alexander, over her hated firstborn son, Ptolemy Chickpea, because Chickpea was conceived that time he raped her. Now, he also knows that the traditionalists in Egypt won't agree with her choice to marry and rule with Alexander because he's a second-born son, setting the stage for yet more civil war. Cleopatra II also knows this, so marries Chickpea, but not before forcing him to divorce his own beloved wife slash sister, who immediately teams up with Alexander and begins another civil war. By the end of it, both Chickpea and Alexander have been pharaoh, and Alexander and Cleopatra III have been murdered. So... Your last great consolation is to make a mess of other people's lives. Yeah. Good joke, isn't it? That was two and a bit episodes. Pop Billy is like the twisted love child of Tyrion Lannister and Joffrey Baratheon, but with the physique of Lord Varys. And watching him gleefully destroy everyone around him is just... joyful. He's like the adage that war is just on the level of politics meant a very happy flesh. He's like a pantomime villain crossed with Richard III, and he was a real guy. Cleopatra VII, the famous one, was his great-granddaughter, and you can see where she got her guile from. The Cleopatras has a hell of a lot of shortcomings, but from what I've read, it's very historically accurate for what was known at the time. It's never been released on DVD, or repeated, but it's on YouTube, and the BBC doesn't seem to give a crap, so I suggest you watch it. It's amazing. <laughs> There are two ways of being king. There's the storyteller way, good, wise, virtuous, handsome, sometimes found in the real world, not often. Your father was one of the rare examples. He came to a sticky end, but whilst he was alive, he was all of those things. Yes. Then there's the other way, my way. It's called making the best of it. But there are two ways of being king. I've decided to try the other one. Virtuous. I wouldn't go so far as to say virtuous, but mild and beneficent, tolerant and forgiving. Once again, I ask, why? Because I've gone to the limit in the other direction. Well, you could have continued. Oh, yes, I could have. I could have sat on a volcano forbidding it to erupt, with the ever-increasing risk of it actually erupting, or of one person erupting and assassinating me. No, thank you. I'm too near death to enjoy the risk of it. Point of being a king isn't excitement, but survival. Nature denied me beauty, so I denied myself virtue. I couldn't be loved, so I decided to be feared. Yes. I was ugly, so I had to settle for an obscene fascination. It's remarkably convenient. It means I can do whatever I want, and no one thinks the worse of me for it. Because they think so badly of you already. Exactly. Not at all. You're concerned with face and figure. So am I. I hope in time to become the ugliest and fattest man in the world. <laughs> you. Oh, go on, say it. You think I'm well on the way to achieving my ambition, is that it? Yes. Yes. Well, unlike poor Demetrius, I, at least, am still alive. Cheers. No, I'm going to devote the rest of my life to being worthy and pious, <laughs> building temples and writing books. Uh, books? Yes, important source works for future historians. <laughs> the life and times of Potbelly the Good, Ptolemy Euergetes the Benign. My reputation will be secure. Massacring people is a good way to stop them rebelling against you, but there are always those it doesn't stop who just become more rebellious. Well, can't you massacre them too? You are the king. But then you're left with no one to be the king of. Oh, that's better. Why don't you take those crowns off? They're so heavy. Did I tell you that we were momentarily short of money? Your mother has run off with the treasury, or as much of it as she could carry with her, on her ships to Syria. The cow? Yes. So you see, a policy of leniency is not only more expedient, it's cheaper. A splendid woman, your mother. Mm, she wanted to kill you. Did she? Oh, I suppose every woman I've ever known has wanted to do that sooner or later. I forgive them all. You see how good I am? I found it to be one of life's great consolations, wine and women. 
Are you fond of women? Oh, very fond. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. It's such a waste of a good title not to be. And the other great consolation I've found... In killing people? Mm. No, no, no. That gets boring after a while. And is he, in fact, what you say he is? Undeniable fact? Fact is what people believe. Undeniable fact is what everyone believes. Oh. It is rare, but convenient to have a king and queen who love one another. She's got a point, too. Oh, love is something they must learn to do with her. As you've done, my dear. They must learn to obey the voice of duty, not of love. They must do what their parents command. As you did when you stole my husband. Oh, if this was a game, I'd say your mother's established a clear lead. And people are tired of chaos. Oh, it's fun for a time, throwing people out of windows, rioting, looting, burning, refusing taxes. But eventually, the people long for peace. And what better symbol can there be of the return to orderly life than the reconciliation of those two great enemies, their king and queen? You'll find in time that mobs are remarkably conservative in their ideas. You think it really matters what the mob thinks? Oh, yeah, she can't do anything without the mob. Ah, but you did when oh. you were king. You see, I've studied my history. Well, I did by killing people, but you can't kill people like that anymore in hundreds, thousands even. You just can't do it. At these coronation ceremonies, for instance, I shall have a massacre. Quite a small massacre, really. Fifty, a hundred people, something like that, on some pretext or other, for speaking disrespectfully of my mistress, Irene, that kind of thing. Then I have them killed. Is that something you want to do? It'll settle one or two old scores and terrify the people of Memphis. Isn't that enough? The first thing about politics is never use your power to settle old scores. You've done so often enough. Not once! Oh, I, I may have killed a second bird with the same stone if it happened to combine well, but settling old scores has never been my main motive. All right, then what's your motive this time in giving your enemy free what she was willing to fight you for? But I've told you I'm pot-bellied the girl. Mm. 